Welcome to Hamburgers and Horror, the home of meat, monsters, and mask-wearing little boys taking on Jason. I'm Noah Hook, and today we're looking at Friday the 13th, the final chapter. This 1984 slasher follows immediately after part 3, as not-so-dead Jason escapes from the morgue and makes his way back to Crystal Lake. This time he crosses paths with a local family and some teens renting a cabin nearby. It doesn't take long for the bodies to start piling up, as the Jarvis family attempts to take down Jason for good. When Friday Part 3 was initially released, it was meant to be the end of a trilogy. But the dummies making these films did absolutely nothing to indicate that it was the end of a trilogy. Producer Frank Mancuso Jr. wanted to be done making Friday films, so he decided to kill Jason for good this time. I got bad news, Frank. The so-called final chapter was directed by Joseph Zito, who has brought us films like Blood Rage, The Prowler, and Missing in Action. For some reason, they also hired Zito to write the screenplay, despite the fact he had never written the script before in his life. He took his extra paycheck to hire an actual screenwriter named Barney Cohen, who has also written Killer Party, Doom Runners, and Guernica. One of Zito and Cohen's biggest decisions was to deviate a bit from the now typical Final Girl formula by adding the Jarvis family into the mix. The film stars a lil baby Corey Feldman from Gremlins, The Goonies, and The Lost Boys as Tommy Jarvis, Kimberly Beck from Massacre at Central High, Roller Boogie, and The Big Blue as Trish Jarvis, Eric Anderson from Bat 21, The Final Cut, and The Neighbor as Rob Dyer, Crispin Glover from Back to the Future, River's Edge, and Willard as Jimmy, and Barbara Howard from Lucky Stiff, White Palace, and Amityville, A New Generation as Sarah. This time around, Jason is played by stuntman and actor Ted White from films like Starman, Romancing the Stone, and Hot Pursuit. He was one of the few seasoned people in the industry on this set, and he and Zito had very different ideas about what were acceptable ways to treat the young cast. Cinematography was handled by Joao Fernandez from films like The Nesting, Children of the Corn, and The Hitman, and the score was of course composed by Harry Manfredini. Tom Savini also returned for special effects, and boy does he flex his muscles here. As usual, Friday Part 4 killed it at the box office, bringing in $33 million off a $2 million budget. It was even more hated than usual by critics, though, with Siskel and Ebert deeming it an immoral and irreprehensible piece of trash. It currently has a 24 and 51% on Rotten Tomatoes, although a 3.2 on Letterboxd shows it has a fair amount of love as well. I'm definitely one of the Final Chapter lovers, I think it has a great mix of humor, scares, and gore, and I think it would have been a solid way to end the franchise. But it's easier to show than tell, so it's probably time we get started. Have any of y'all seen The Corkscrew? Cause we're watching Friday the 13th, the final chapter. The movie opens on our homie Paul Holt's campfire tale about Jason, which also incorporates some of our favorite lines and kills from the previous three films. The flashbacks cap off with Chris chopping Jason in the face, and our new title card comes exploding in. We jump right back into the mix as the Wessex County Police Department is cleaning up the many bodies Jason has piled up at Higgins Haven. They also pick up the body of Jason himself, who has seemingly died from his injuries. The paramedics strap him in just to be safe, and they bring Jason to the morgue. I'm so glad the final chapter continues the trend of increasingly bizarre locals, this time with sleazy-ass coroner Axel. He is a nasty bastard. Real cute girl. Was. Well, she still is. Ah, looks like he and Nurse Robbie haven't watched Halloween 2, cause otherwise they'd know screwing right now is a death sentence. Robbie finds Axel's weird fucking workout videos, porn, something in between, I have no idea. Axel scares her from the darkness, but Robbie is still down for some hanky panky. Jason's hand falls from the stretcher, scaring the Jesus Christmas, holy Jesus, goddamn, holy Jesus, jumping Christmas shit out of Axel. Robbie leaves in a huff, and Axel very carelessly puts Jason in the icebox. 
He gets back to his favorite ladies, but his fun is put to an end when Jason slashes his throat with a hacksaw and twists his head all the way around. Next, he lifts Robbie into the air and slices her open with a scalpel. And the next day, we meet the Jarvis family. We've got Mama Tracy, young adult daughter Trish, and horribly deformed son Tommy. Just kidding, beneath that dope alien mask is a four-eyed, bowl-cutted Tom Savini level mask maker. They of course live on Crystal Lake, and the family discusses that the rental cabin next door is being inhabited by some rowdy teens this weekend. Let's meet them! The eclectic group consists of Paul, his girlfriend Sam, Virgin Sarah, her boyfriend Doug, Awkward Jimmy, and Jokester Ted. Jimmy is currently wondering why the girl he was seeing ghosted him, and Ted concludes that his buddy is a dead fuck. A dead fuck? A lousy lay. The crew realizes they are lost right in front of Mama Voorhees' grave, and they're unable to pick up this hippy-dippy hitchhiker. She flips them the bird and starts macking on this banana like nobody's business. This absolute queen meets an untimely death via a knife to the neck. The teens arrive at the cabin by nightfall, and Tommy escapes a Jarvis sandwich to find his dog Gordon has returned home. Best of luck, Gordon. Animals don't fare too well in this franchise. Tommy also catches a sneak peek of our horny meat bags, and Mama Tracy shows concern as he and Trish greet their new neighbors. Nice girl Sarah asks Sam what it's like to be sexually active, and she's nervous to sleep in the same bunk bed as her boyfriend Doug. Peeping Tommy is also learning about the birds and the bees, and the little perv goes absolutely caveman when he catches a glimpse of Sam and Paul getting it on. Too bad helicopter mom has to ruin all the voyeurism. Just as Jimmy is contemplating calling Betty, in cycles the promiscuous twins Tina and Terry. Sarah HATES sexually empowered women and heads back, while the others join Tina and Terry on their way to the lake. I mean, would it really be a Friday film without skinny dipping? Hey, at least we get some man ass to even things out here. And this is how Tommy learned he's bisexual. Trish gets him out of there, but the boys invite her to party with them later tonight. Sam tries to convince Sarah to join them in the water, and when that fails, she just yanks her in. On the way home, the Jarvis car breaks down, and as they're trying to remedy the issue, they're snuck upon by this camper guy named Rob. After helping fix their engine trouble, Trish offers him a ride. She asks Rob what he's hunting with such a big gun, which he claims is for taking down bears. He seems surprised that anybody lives this close to the lake, and is even more concerned to hear about the rowdy teens nearby. Lil' spicious, Robbie boy. These bored-ass kids invite the armed stranger inside, and Tommy brings him to the man cave. He's a bona fide horror fan and special effects prodigy, and he shows Rob all of his best works. Back at the rental, Jimmy tries putting the moves on Terry, with some of the most enthusiastic dance moves I've ever seen. Ted's extremely forward style is very ineffective, and Tina is disappointed to learn the cute boys are taken. Did teenagers ever just dance around like this? Simpler times. Trish sees Rob out as he heads to the woods, and lets him know he's welcome back anytime. Ted gives Jimmy more horrible advice, and the twins treat shotgunning like a wet t-shirt contest, with Tina officially making the moves on Paul right in front of Sam. Doug convinces Sarah not to get involved as Sam goes to take a sad swim, and Ted is enraged that his uninterested twin has been stolen. Sam hears someone trailing her in the woods, but unfortunately for her it isn't Paul. Of course she gets naked for a solo night swim, and she paddles her way out to the raft. We finally get our first glimpse of Jason as he bursts from the lake, stabbing Sam through the raft and out the back. Paul decides not to cheat on his girlfriend in the literal cabin she's staying in, and heads down to the lake to find her. I'm sorry, what the fuck is Crispin Glover doing with those cheese doodles? Damn, now Tina is making the moves on him, and Jimmy can't resist the offer to go upstairs. Bro, have you ever seen a woman more disappointed to spend time with a man? Paul swims out and finds his dead girlfriend, and when he makes it back to the dock, he's stabbed with a harpoon gun. Fire away! 
Weird Guy Rob hears the commotion from his campsite and he catches a glimpse of Jason on his way back. Jason says guns may kill people, but I kill guns. Jimmy and Tina get to Doinkin and Ted finds a film reel for a silent era porno flick? Um, okay. Terry is ready to hit the road, but Tina isn't done enjoying Crispin's Glover quite yet. She heads out into the rain, but doesn't even get on her bike before Jason impales her off screen. Apparently this flapper shit got Sarah hot and bothered, and she invites Doug to join her in the bottom bunk tonight. Mama Jarvis arrives home to find her kids missing. Wait, where are they? She searches for them inside and out, but Jason finds her off screen. I guess the Jarvis kids went shopping? Okay, whatever gets mom alone I guess. They arrive home to find the house empty, and a concerned Trish decides to search their usual jogging path. This of course leads her to Rob's tent, who almost mistakenly gives her the Voorhees treatment. Yeah, this guy isn't hunting bears. Tina helps Jimmy confirm he isn't a dead fuck. He brags to Ted about how alive his fuck was, and to celebrate he grabs a bottle of wine. Ted! Hey Ted, where the hell's the corkscrew? Here's your corkscrew, and a cleaver to the face for good measure. Up next is Tina, who simply gets yeeted out of a window by Jason, who for some reason went out onto the roof. At least we get a cool car stunt. Trish has learned that Rob is the brother of Sandra, who was killed by Jason in part 2. Trish tells him that her killer died at Higgins Haven, but she didn't hear about his escape from the morgue. She realizes Tommy could be in danger, and I guess Jason is back in the kitchen now. While Sarah and Doug get busy in the shower, Ted is still watching 1920s porn. The very drunk pervert finally meets his end via a knife to the head, courtesy of Jason from behind the movie screen. Sarah confesses her love to Doug as she heads to bed, but he's not going to get the chance to reciprocate. Jason sets the mood lighting before smashing through the shower door and simply smashes Doug's head with one hand. Jason was planning to throw the virgin into the Crystal Lake volcano, but now that Sarah's done the deed, all she gets is an axe to the chest. Trish and Rob return to find Tommy, but before they can call for help, Jason rips out the landline. Jason's really bouncing all over the place this film. Trish, Rob, and Gordon head across the yard to check on the teens, but as we have established, they are all dead. While they are out, Tommy finds Rob's newspaper clippings about Jason, including an image of his deformed childhood face. Gordon gets spooked and just yeets himself out of the movie. Good boy! For some reason, Rob goes down to the basement, and for some reason, Jason is already down there. Voorhees just grabs a nearby wrench and beats the ever-living fuck out of Rob. Trish only decides to help after he's dead, but when Jason grabs her from below, she's able to hack his hand up a bit. After stumbling across a few corpses, she makes it back home, and Tommy helps her board up the cabin. These poor fuckers never know that Jason prefers to use his previous victims to break through the windows, which is exactly what he does here. Jason bursts in and snatches Tommy, but Trish fights him off with a hammer claw to the neck. Ouch. He busts the door down and nearly beheads Trish with her own hammer, and the two flee upstairs and barricade themselves in Tommy's room. Jason begins breaking in with an axe, but Trish gives him the stew mocker treatment. Trish decides to distract Jason to give Tommy time to escape, as she lures him back to the rental cabin. He chases her upstairs, and we get our third window yeet of the film as Trish Sally Hardesties herself to the ground. She struggles to get to her feet, and Tommy decides to do more than simply escape. Jason follows the injured girl home as Tommy starts hacking off his hair, and Trish just misses him with a machete swipe. Ooh, she does get him in the hand real good though. She gets him again in the chest before he tackles her to the floor, but before he can finish her, he is called by Tommy. Jason is bewildered by the familiar looking face, but before he can kill and or hug Tommy, he gets his mask whacked off by Trish. Oh hell yes, this is a top tier Jason look. This gives Tommy the chance to grab Jason's machete, and the little lad slams that sucker right into Jason's face. 
The big man topples and his face slides down the blade. But Bald Tommy ain't done yet, as when Jason simply twitches, he goes fucking ham on his head again and again. We fade to white as Trish and Tommy make it to a hospital, and she's really worried about her brother's mental state after such a violent attack. The movie ends as the two embrace, with Tommy staring down the audience to supposedly end the franchise. And that's the final chapter. This is a fun one. It is quintessential Friday the 13th with a great mix of sex and humor while still keeping its slasher roots at the forefront. Ted White brings a great energy to Jason. He's less of a clumsy oaf and more of a deliberate assassin this time around. I say this with every film, but I wish we got to see more of him here. Like it's the fourth film and supposedly the finale. Stop hiding Jason in the shadows and off screen. We want the hockey mask. But that final act is hard to beat. Aside from maybe part 6, this is my favorite design for Jason, and those effects by Tom Savini are freaking gorgeous. It's a tiny detail, but I love Jason's fingernails in this one. Tommy and Trish are great new protagonists. They both put up a great fight while still being interesting characters, especially Tommy. I will say this is one of the most forgettable group of teen victims in the whole franchise. I seriously forget their names every five minutes or so. Doug and Paul literally only exist to be killed. It is funny to me that Jimmy and Ted, who would typically be the throwaway gag characters in a movie like this, are actually the ones we spend the most time with in the film. I do wish Rob had a little bit more to do, but at least he has an iconic death scene. I'm also glad we got more Crystal Lake locals, Axel and Banana Girl are series highlights for sure. But because the majority of characters in this film are very one note or unexplored, I did find myself kind of bored whenever Jason wasn't on screen. But even so, this film still has so much charm to it. You got Lil Corey Feldman rocking incredible masks, a 10 out of 10 good boy, a ridiculous amount of window stunts, Crispin Glover's bizarre dance moves, Axel's weird dance videos, Ted's silent era porn, the random horny twins who just show up and don't leave, and so many other weird little intricacies that make this a very memorable film and what can sometimes be a very repetitive franchise. All in all, part 4 is a very solid Friday the 13th. Jason has fully mastered his murderous craft, Crystal Lake has gained even more personality, and we get to witness one of the single best killer deaths of all time. It's got a little bit of everything you're looking for in a Friday film, and it really would have been a great end to the franchise. But as we all know, that is far from the case, so soon we'll be checking out a new beginning. But first we're going to check out a patron request and a personal favorite of mine, so be sure to tune in in two weeks as we check out Basket Case. Well, that's about it. Thank you all so much for joining me, and an extra thank you to my patrons. As always, I'm Noah Hook, and thanks for watching Hamburgers and Horror. Stay safe out there. Thanks for watching my review of Friday the 13th, the final chapter. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up with all my horror reviews. And if you want to help support the channel further, you should check out my Patreon account. You'll be able to vote for future movies and franchises I cover on the channel. Thanks y'all.